This is an Audio Wool original. This episode of Fright Day is brought to you by Drinks of Hell Chipotle Hot Sauce by Fright Day. Bold Chipotle flavor blended with habanero peppers for just the right burn. Kissed with garlic and passion fruit. Zero human blood, like none at all. Visit shop.frightday.com before the first batch disappears. Hey guys, thanks for listening. If you'd like to support us, go to patreon.com slash frightday. Fire emergency. Please don't talk to I'm sorry, I can't. Hey, they found the bodies of at least three young boys. Six more bodies under the John Gacy house. And... One longtime acquaintance describes Dahmer as one weird dude. Stay tuned for Byron Serial Corner. Did the big Kelly exhale before? <laughs> before I mean, start. you do know where it comes from. Yeah. It's intense. I didn't start with a hard so. You get so much in your brain. <laughs> Kelly, before you landed this total catch to my left, what were some of the traits that you were looking for in a partner? I am not dating Jamie. No, no I'm sorry. Jamie's, I consider her behind me. Sam is to my left. But behind, as she, no, as she I, should be. A... Absolutely. That's where she belongs. Maybe <laughs> sweet, a- attentive. Never forgetting special occasions like birthdays, giving flowers, cards. Could always be counted on for favors. The the kind of guy who would scrape the ice off a windshield for you. I was honestly wondering how long it would take you to do a report about me. Well, I mean. Someday soon. <laughs> what do you think, Kelly? Were those things on my list? Yeah, I mean. Uh, I mean, pretty close. You missed out on the part about believing in ghosts. However superficial, these traits could just be masking uh, something sinister. Yeah? Beginning in the winter of 74, climaxing in the fall of 1986, the peaceful hideaway I call home was gripped in fear, temporarily at the mercy of a weird man named Wayne Nathan Nance, the Missoula Mauler. So before we get started, can we talk about the fact that our local hockey team thought it was a good idea to call themselves the Missoula Maulers. That was really weird for a long time. I didn't realize that that was his nickname. And when you started doing research for your episodes, I was like, oh, I better look a little bit up. And I saw that and I'm like, why didn't people lose their minds over the fact that our hockey team was the Missoula Maulers? Because you know, everyone involved with the situation and the town is an idiot. Well, that's true. And it, it was, was also run by a bunch of crazy right-wing Christians. So okay, that probably explains so it more than boy, anything. I've but... been wanting to talk about this guy for a long time time oddly enough i didn't really know much about wayne until a couple years ago which is weird because you love serial killers i don't love them i'm into them Mm. he went to the same high school that i did he uh, went to school with my aunt even though i have yet to talk to her to see if she has any stories uh i'm going to he actually lived in the same trailer park that she currently does whoa i didn't know that part and he worked a couple blocks away from my grandma's house and his final victims were attacked less than a mile from my parents house Ugh. Wow. Could have been you. I mean, I was... Uh, he, you weren't quite uh, alive yet, yeah, were you? Yeah, I was not. I was. Could have been me. Could have been you. Most of you know we live in Missoula, Montana. Ish. If you can call it living. <laughs> For those unfamiliar, let's set the scene a bit. Uh, Missoula is the second largest city in Montana, located on the western side of the state, along the Clark Fork River at the convergence of five mountain ranges. And note I said city. Because we don't ride horses, okay? I mean, no, a lot of people here do. Not to work or school. We don't. The four of us don't ever ride horses. No, no, we work at home. Can we not paint that picture? I mean, it, it's not a common mode of transportation. Thank you. It's but it your, is a common activity. It's a recreational activity. Yeah, we have mules. Damn. Uh, it's your average college town. It it's is. a small city. People compare it to like a smaller Austin or a smaller Madison, yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, beard or weird or whatever those bumper stickers say. Yeah, I mean, it's like a liberal dot in a very conservative state. So yeah. we represent that same kind of vibe that you'll see in other similar locations. And the origin of the name itself, and tell me if you have any other idea lake. of this no i mean the, the glacial lake missoula of course but the name missoula itself has always kind of been in dispute some believe it goes back to a tribal language the word is soul sure it does we stole everything well, so why not that it means terrible and likely references the canyon sure. the flathead indians had to travel to hunt in the plains it's a stretch where the blackfeet tribe would attack them 
Oh. So maybe that's it. Oh, yeah. Do you think it was some future knowledge of the pedal powered beer drinking Uh-oh. tables that clog our traffic? Yeah, you know the ones. Three miles an hour. Yeah, people love drinking while pedaling uh, transportation, I suppose. Yeah. This place got a whole lot worse on October 19th, 1955, when Wayne Nathan Nance was born to George and Charlene Nance a couple that friends and neighbors considered hardworking, uh, the blue-collar type folks. Charlene, she was a hardworking waitress who sometimes drank a little bit more than she should have. George, he was a truck driver in the logging industry. Up until the 90s, logging was a, a huge part of the Missoula economy. My dad actually worked at a plant making plywood. As did mine. Really? I didn't know that. Does he have all his fingers? Uh, you know, I've never. Neither never of them looked. are a senator, so yes, they do. Oh, that's a fun reference. We have a, a senator who only does hang and lose. And that's pretty cool. Which is honestly, uh, it's a it was, that was a butcher shop accident, though. So we're talking logging here. True, I heard he got stuck in a combine, but that's another story. My dad made plywood until they closed, and they actually paid for him to go back to school uh, and to be a teacher. And he actually gave his last lesson last week. My dad is not dead; he retired. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I want to say happy retirement happy to my dad. Happy retirement, Tom. He doesn't listen to this because he doesn't agree with my lifestyle of darkness. Do. But He doesn't listen to this? I don't know. He might. I was going to say, your, your mom does, doesn't she? I'm joking. Happy retirement, dad. Your parents are like so supportive of you. They're amazing. They're I love them. Great. Anyway, as a young couple, the Nances moved to a, a decent trailer park in Missoula. It was actually one of the only ones at the time to have paved roads. They settled in and they had four children. The oldest was Desiree, then Wayne, then William, and Veda being the youngest. Now, everything I've read paints the picture that Wayne was considered a cute child. But I can't help visualizing some sort of combination of Scud Farkas from A Christmas Story mixed with a kid from Problem Child. He's pale, he's redheaded, freckled, and... uh, You just described Alfred E. Newman. uh, Throw him in the mix. Like many Montana families, whether it's hunting, fishing, or camping, the Nance family love the outdoors. Sam, your family loved the outdoors. Uh, yeah, everyone at the, the compound, it was an important part of our life. Oh, jo- God. George loved outdoor recreation the most, and he took every opportunity he could get to get out. And in the early 1960s, they actually moved to a rougher trailer park in East Missoula. That was the first place that <laughs> Sam and I lived together. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Where'd you Montana live? Montana Street in Emo. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we're going to be in East Missoula quite a bit in this story. George and Charlene's relationship followed that rougher direction. The couple fighting more than average, mostly due to financial issues. And Charlene seemed especially affected by this, exhausted by having to carry most of the weight of raising her four kids and working full-time while George was trucking out of town. This shortened her patience with her children and mostly with Wayne who from an early age, he was a bit of a troublemaker. Uh, There was just something off about him. He's definitely not the guy you would want to share a bus seat with. Kelly, did people share a bus seat with you? Um, My mom drove me to school through my junior year of high school. And Sam rode a horse? Sam, yes, he actually rode a mule. Our our school was right there, so we didn't have to leave. Oh, my God. Okay. In elementary school, a then second grader accidentally dropped her glasses on the way to school. They slid back on the floor of the bus, landing at the feet of Wayne, who picked them up. He raised them up, unbroken, to the girl's relief. And then after a brief back and forth, he twisted them in two and threw them forward into her lap, And as a guy who got glasses at a young age, the idea of going home with broken glasses and telling your parents, it's kind of traumatizing. Speaking of a Christmas story. Did he break his glasses? Yeah, in a fight. No, in a fight with Farkas. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. The mother of the girl, she came over to the Nance house and George answered the door. His response to this whole situation was just, Boys will be boys. What do you expect from an eight-year-old? So many great things that come from that phrase, aren't there? (sighs) Boys boys will be boys. Yeah, that's the single worst. So before moving to East Missoula, the owner of the nice trailer park recalled witnessing something even more evil than breaking glasses. One day in the dead of winter, Wayne was seen standing in front of an incinerator that was used to burn garbage in the trailer park. I actually have fond memories of my dad burning our garbage in a big metal garbage can. 
you know. I don't think that's legal. However, he wasn't burning trash. There was a shelf next to this furnace that a family of kittens were using as their home, a place to stay warm during brutal Montana winters. He slid their bodies into the furnace. Oh, my God. Boys will be boys. Ugh. Can we get to the part where he kills people? We'll get there. If my calculations are correct, though, this is 1.5 out of 3 in the McDonald triad already. You know, the McDonald triad, it's a set of three factors that if you have any combination of two, uh, you're more likely to have later violent tendencies in life. Well, that's, you're a Gemini, uh, <laughs> you have that. a mullet, well, I mean, the mullet and you have three, three names. Yeah, or you, it's just you're more likely to offend in a serial manner. It's fire, animal cruelty, and bedwetting. I'd say that's uh, probably two. Two, yeah, yeah, I'm, I think solidly checked off there. On the subject of serial killer traits, though, Wayne experienced a, a head injury a few years later. He was racing around on his bike when he accidentally flipped over the handlebars, landing square on his head and skidding on his skull against pavement. And this is all without being recorded by a DV camera and starting by saying, Hi, I'm Wayne Nance. Welcome to Jackass. Okay, so hold on just a second. For real, though. <laughs> yes. Was this a traumatic brain injury thing? Is this why they think... Well, he was already burning yeah, kittens. That, that's the thing is he was already on this path. So whether or not it just kind of pushed him over the edge, uh, I mean... Super interesting. It is. According to his friends, he just stood straight up and got back on his bike and... Behavior problems aside, Wayne was actually known as a good student. He was academically inclined, which gave him more leniency with teachers than he would have otherwise. He liked to read a lot, and he knew more about a lot of things that his peers didn't, including sex, which is Uh kind of another early indicator for children who have, uh, I guess, later life criminal sexual problems. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. December 14th, 1968 was a rough day for the Nance clan. Around 9 p.m., George, his, the father, entered the Super Save store where the assistant manager, Howard Brian, was working alone, counting money. With a gun in hand, George demanded the gray canvas bag that he was counting money out of and then proceeded to tape the man's hands behind his back, walk him to the rear of the store where he hit him in the back of the head with a pistol. Which seems a little unnecessary. It seems a bit much. Yeah. George then ran to the front of the store, threw a salt block through the window, only to find the armored bank truck pulling up. He ran back inside. They called the police, who eventually, with the help of canines, found George hiding in the store. After bonding out, the family was able to celebrate Christmas, which was... Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, it's always nice, but he would soon be given the sentence of five years in jail for felony robbery. Now... My parents aren't those kinds of criminals. I don't actually know if they're criminals, period. I was going to say, you're no, I think mine are, mine are probably like the uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith type criminals. <laughs> oh, that would be fun to yeah. have parents like that. That's what I imagine. Well, I mean, unlike that, this has to be an embarrassing thing to see a picture of your father in the newspaper for something like this. And what, f- just much. failed so stupidly at a very simple crime. <sighs> yeah, just go out the door and be chill, George. Come on. At, at school, his teachers were shocked by what his father did, but they still had hoped that Wayne would snap out of this mean streak, stop going down this path, but it only got worse. George was now back home after being paroled after less than a year, 11 days before Wayne would complete the fifth grade. He actually vowed to beat up the same kid every day for the next 11 days because he had gotten in trouble for another fight but he only did this for two days i don't know what stopped him i think george probably put an end to that pretty quick i mean it seems like it was probably a high point for him because it was uh this whole idea of control and structure and he gets to orchestrate the whole thing around it i mean that kind of planning seems very serial killery yeah right? i mean that was uh the grade school years oh god you ready for high school no i mean no 
Wouldn't you know it, it's a confusing time for absolutely everyone. I mean, honestly, middle school was worse, but yeah, well, that's fine. Well, actually, it was more popular in middle school. I had a great time. Everything was awesome, I thought, for all those times. <laughs> well, you had you the same are, teacher you guys are the whole time, and you were in the same classroom with the same people, the same exactly. six. And it just so happens that she gave birth to all of us. <laughs> okay. So Wayne attended Sentinel High School. I graduated there. As did I. And Sam, you are still technically in school. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> it's it's like um, Korea. Like, technically, we're still at war just because we haven't signed the paperwork. But, so, so, yeah, I guess. Students described him as, quote, far out and a little weird. And he was mostly known for his art. Uh, the style was described as technically accurate, tight, and crisp. At the same time, freakish, dark, and violent, <laughs> characterized by bloody swords, daggers, and battle swords? axes. Mm -hmm. yes. And monsters. And it was, quote, certainly negative. But that sounds like things that 80% of weird high school age boys draw. Yeah, I was going to say, it reminds me of this kid who sat next to me. I, I, he was really into the band Tool. He shaved off his eyebrows. One time he, he drew a very intricate sketch of little... <laughs> Little men stabbing my legs and lighting them on fire. Yeah, he silently slid that to me one day in class. That was fun. Do you want to talk about that some more? Th this kid also had knives soldered onto his boots, so... Uh, what? I wonder what, he, uh, wonder what he's doing now. God! I bet he's still making <laughs> knives out of stuff. <laughs> so, so, Wayne. Back to Wayne. Maybe I should do a report on this guy. I mean, you are going to crack the case. He was a fan of doo-wop songs from the 50s. Okay, that seems less violent than I was expecting. A young Wayne Nance. Light denim jeans. Ripped up. Uh, a military jacket. Strolling down the halls. Loudly singing Blue Moon. Yep. It's, not, it's not fun. We all make questionable fashion choices. I dyed my hair a bunch of colors, and I had blue-tinted glasses for a while, and for a brief period of time, I owned a puka shell necklace. Oh, everybody did. Sam dyed his hair blonde at one point. Did Is you that right? That? Yeah. I could my see it. was various colors. I never had a puka shell necklace. Really? He accessorized most days with a shrunken head necklace that he got at a novelty store. He still managed high points in class, well above a three-point his darkness found focus at this point in black magic and the occult, in pagan mythology, Satanism, and uh, Vikings. Also, can we just pause for a second? Getting sure. well above a three-point at Sentinel really just means that you have a pulse. I tried my best, no, and did. I did actually pretty well. Never mind. Uh, he would tell his friends, quote, I have been ordained a third-degree witch. My goal is to become a warlock. I am moving up in the ranks. I'm in a coven. And his friends thought awesome. he was... Awesome. Uh, yeah. well, friends, friends, wait a second, friends? Oh, I mean, we'll get to the friends. They thought he was full of shit. <laughs> and rightfully so, because to my knowledge, uh, that's not how the hierarchy in covens works. Honestly... It's just another, like, it's just a religion, and you can pretty much do whatever you want <laughs> All to. All right. Uh, he also started saying that his birthday was on Halloween, even though it was actually October 18th. And this all seems like some angsty teen bullshit. Uh, many people at the time were into the same thing. Anton LaVey had released the Satanic Bible. Paperback copies of The Exorcist were out. The Ouija boards were flying off the shelves. And like, literally, they couldn't. They called an exorcist. Oh, right. oh, Sam. But this was not that. This was more than that. Wayne always had a knife on him, which even... It's Montana. Well, even before our modern school violence, uh, that is just not something that was allowed in schools. One time in a locker room, a large jackknife fell out while he was getting dressed. Everyone in the room was too scared to say anything. Record but skip. <laughs> they all just stared forward and pretended they didn't see him slide the knife back towards him with his foot and put it in his pocket. During his senior year, he came into possession of a hypodermic needle, and he bragged to his friends that he was going to stab someone in the halls before the end of the day. He did that. He actually stabbed a boy in the leg and then ran away laughing. Jesus. And although disturbing, this is nothing compared to what would happen next. Wayne was going to follow through on a horrific threat that he shared with his close friends. He told them that in order to move up in his coven, 
he needed to kill someone before he turned 19. Okay, well, that I mean, that checks out. That makes more sense. You seem to know a lot about covens, Sam. Uh, yes. Uh, Kelly, I've kind of peppered in these little uh, breathers for you. Okay. You might want to take five. Okay, I can make your muff. Can Sm- I, I can't even sing to myself, can I? Because smoke break? I don't know. I don't what do it? smoke breaks. All yeah, right, well. I'm going to do a walkabout. I'm going to go do some weights. I'll be back. Okay. Some weights, okay. Siobhan McGinnis, then only five years old, was snatched from the sidewalk on February 5th, 1974, while walking in a Missoula North Side neighborhood. She was headed home from visiting a friend and was escorted as far as Whittier School, continuing alone from there, which was only three blocks. When she didn't arrive home after 11 p.m., her mother reported Siobhan missing, and a manhunt began lasting only two days. City police, sheriff's department, fish and game, and even the FBI joined in the search. 130 volunteers canvassed, searching sheds, abandoned cars, riverbanks. And the day after the snatching, a woman claiming to be a psychic actually called the police, saying that she had a vision of a child in a culvert. The following day, a few miles down the interstate, the body of Siobhan McGinnis was found face down outside of a culvert. She was still in her blue jeans and a purple corduroy coat. A fresh, heavy snow covered a trail of blood from the road, and dozens of Missoula City police officers quickly trampled through the crime scene, and one was even seen sifting his fingers through blood-splattered snow, looking for something? I don't know. Oh, not not quite. Um, the lack of footprints led authorities to believe that she was put in the culvert and dragged out by dogs, or even more gut-wrenching, that the girl possibly was trying to crawl out towards the road. Uh, autopsy results determined that she was both stabbed in the chest and hit in the head, and that she had also been sexually assaulted. I feel weird telling Kelly to come back in because it's... Hey, Kelly. We, we're, we're almost to the funny part. Yeah? Come on in. <laughs> Welcome. Ready? Ready I am. Okay. A little more than a month later... By the way, I should tell you, a little girl was murdered. Okay. A little more... How old? Five. Oh, fuck. Okay, I'm glad you gave me your muffs. Thanks. Okay. Yep. A little more than a month later... On April 11th, 1974, it was Monday Thursday, which is the day before Good Friday, hopefully. I don't know. I'm not religious, so I don't know how to pronounce that. And Donna Pound was driving home after helping her friend, an Avon lady, make deliveries. And Kelly, you help all your Avon friends with deliveries, right? Avon, the original pyramid scheme. No, um, I don't. Her husband, Harvey, he's a fundamentalist preacher without his own flock, was working at a place called Yon's Men's Store. Y-A-N-D-T-S. Huh. I don't know this place. Are you familiar at all? No, I, I typically no. clothe myself at Men's Warehouse. Oh, <laughs> close, yes. At this place, he was known as an excellent shoe salesman. Donna also had part-time employment at a Christian bookstore, as well as she was a volunteer at St. Patrick's Hospital. Nice. Uh, recently, Harvey had became a DJ at a local Christian radio station where he would often warn against the rise of Satanism and its dangers. Basically good people, very devout Christians. Uh, Harvey would get uncomfortable if he even saw a beer in his friend's refrigerators. He's that kind of guy. Like, that kind of guy. Yes. A little after 1.30 p.m., Donna arrived home to find her door unlocked, which was fine because she left it that way so real estate agents could access it. They didn't have those keypad things that we have today. Inside the house, it was quiet. Her daughter, Kathy, was still in school. And what I'm about to describe next is what police believe happened and... Unlike the Kelly warning, this is a general warning. What happened is very evil and graphic. Donna enters her master bedroom where she encounters a man. He's wearing gloves and had her husband's 22 caliber Luger in his hands. She was forced into submission 
most likely at this point recognizing the gun as her husband's, which was hidden in a built-in cabinet drawer in their bedroom. That's where it normally was. A warning shot is fired, the slug landing somewhere near her sewing machine, and he orders her onto the bed. Short sections of white knotted clothesline are pulled from a black bag, then used to tie her wrists and ankles to the bedposts. He pulls off her pants and uses a knife to cut off her undergarments, slitting them down the middle. He removed her sanitary napkin and dropped oh, oh, and dropped it on the floor beside the bed. And at this point, he raped her. After he was done, he untied her and led her, still naked from the waist down, into the unfinished basement, forcing her to kneel under the stairwell. There, after retying her restraints and taping her mouth shut, he stood behind her and shot five bullets into her head. Five. Her body fell forward, and the killer then placed the gun between her legs, inserting it inside her and leaving it there. And... Uh. Then he left. No one in the neighborhood heard the gunshots, and a little before 6 p.m., her husband Harvey arrived home, entering the front door. On the floor in front of the TV was his daughter, Kathy, and a friend from school. When asked where her mother was, she responded casually, I don't know, Dad. Why? But there are ropes on all the beds, and the rug is messed up in there. He walked around the house, confirming there was indeed ropes tied with hitch knots on all of the bedposts. Hold up. So you're telling me the daughter came home from school, saw ropes everywhere, and was just like, eh, everything's fine, I'm gonna go watch some TV. There was also a rope laced around the base of the toilet and over the bathroom door. Well, that was appointment TV then. (laughs) Oh my god. Wow. In the master bedroom, he discovered the discarded sanitary napkin cut underpants, there was a single shoe left at the foot of the bed, and the empty holster his gun was once in. Someone had actually cut through the leather to remove it. At this point, his focus shifted to getting his daughter and her friend out of the house. He said, Kathy, why don't you go over to your girlfriend's house? I'll call you later. She put up a bit of a fight, wanting to finish, like Sam said, the television program, and he said, please do this for me and they left. At this point, he had been in every room of the house except the basement, and it was 5.59 when he called the Missoula County Sheriff's Department to report what he found there. And this, to this day, is still considered one of the most vile crime scenes that our city has ever seen. I don't know. That recent one was pretty bad, but yeah. Uh, yeah. What one? You know, the bodies bodies and barrels. Oh, yeah, that one. I don't mean the to, other one that was over by don't your mean house. To, well, we don't need to talk about that. The timing of Donna Pound's murder, which was, again, right before Good Friday, fueled gossip of satanic cult murders, believing it to be botched. Excuse me, I'm throwing up because that was fucking awful. Yeah, yeah. Believing it to have been botched, the original intention to kill a virgin, a Christian, and a betrayer in that order... A book detailing the ritual was actually rumored to be found behind their house, their daughter being the virgin, Donna being the Christian, and Harvey being the betrayer. And although just rumor, this would actually make a lot of sense. Later, it was revealed that Harvey was actually having an affair with a member of his congregation. Of course he was. Uh, More rumors were that the rope represented nooses from the Salem witch trials. Oh, wow. That a devil sign was painted on the basement wall in Donna's blood. Body parts of hers were found in Paddy Canyon. What? People really ran. Okay. This all confirmed Harvey's fears of Satanism that he'd been talking about on his radio show, that maybe his words had made him a target. To police, on the other hand, at this point, Harvey was their prime suspect. I mean, they used his gun... No one could corroborate his alibi of being at the clothing store where he was during his lunch break for 45 minutes. My guess is, again, he's probably a nice guy, but maybe not a lot of friends. And if you don't have a lot of friends, you don't have anyone to eat lunch with. We're going to get into this more later, but like I ate lunch alone most days in high school. So yeah. 
Over the next couple days, he would contact the police several times, suspiciously having discovered new evidence on his property. One of the strangest bits of evidence that he found was actually a second bullet that had been lodged in a dictionary on the bookshelf in his daughter's room. Then the police received an interesting tip that would turn their suspicion away from Harvey. A woman came forward saying that she was certain that she saw a neighbor boy in the pound's backyard that day. Oh. Then another neighbor reported a similar looking boy in the area. Boy. And yet another saw a man walking away from the home carrying a black bag headed towards Tamarack Trailer Park. Do you know where this one is? No. Yeah. I know where Tamarack Brewery is. Yeah. Okay. That wasn't around then. Very, very close where I grew up. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, this boy was 18-year-old Wayne Nance. And Wayne was actually a friend of the Pound family. He was friendly with all of them, but most of all, their son, Kenny. They had known each other since the third grade and used to be next-door neighbors. He knew where Harvey hid his gun. They had actually shot it together. They had... And he had actually missed school that day. Deputies drove to the trailer park, search warrant in hand, where they were met at the door by Wayne's mother, Charlene, who was well aware at this point that her son was under suspicion. Police found his room cluttered but organized. They spotted a black gym bag. Inside, detectives found a lot of things, uh, a whole bunch of twenty-two caliber bullets and shell casings. They were the same brand used in the murder. Inside his drawer were a pair of his underpants with a large rust-colored stain. Oh, Jesus. That they immediately recognized as blood, but they had actually been recently washed by his mother. <laughs> oh, my God. At this point, an interview and a blood sample were obviously requested from Wayne. Meanwhile, back at Sentinel High School. Oh, God, it's so oh, weird the to hear memories, that. right? Ugh. According to a classmate, close friend, and Taco John's co-worker... Bill Van Kanigan. Why does that sound familiar well, to me? Well, he, he actually still lives in Missoula, and he's a lawyer. Oh, my God. I know this guy. <laughs> okay. Well, upon arriving at school on that Good Friday, Bill found Wayne sitting on a concrete ledge, almost in like a trance. And Wayne, kind of out of the blue, said, It's been done. Obviously startled, Bill said, What's been done? Wayne repeated himself and then slowly revealed the inside of his milky forearm to the boy, where a slightly infected pentagram had been branded. It's like he fancied Suddenly his... he let out an eerie, high-pitched, hysterical laugh and ran down the hallway. <laughs> All right. Up the stairs. Kelly, remember those stairs? Oh, I know those stairs well. It's different now. You now that you know this. Over the next couple weeks, Wayne's behavior became more and more erratic. He would threaten Bill with remarks packed with double meanings and straight up threaten to kill a co-worker at Taco John's. And honestly, I'd kill for some potato olays from Taco John's right now. Yeah, we oh, still eat yeah. Taco John's. I mean, this is the scary thing. Taco John's is far and away the best fast food Mexican that's available yeah, in, they, in our region. They got a whole lot of Mexican going on. Uh, the threats paired with the whole killing before 19 thing and it's been done comment led Bill to go to the principal saying, there's a kid in our school who says he killed Donna Pounds. Oh, so like Bill was huge in this. I mean, you'll find out later just how much Bill had to do with this. The principal told him to contact the sheriff and wasn't really surprised because they had already been asking about Wayne. He was actually a bit conflicted because he's like, we need to protect our students, but we also need to protect this student. He didn't want... To... So he didn't believe Bill. I mean, he told Bill to talk to the sheriff and Bill did talk to the sheriff. What he gave a shithead him... for not helping out this kid that came to you. <laughs> All right. I mean, that is kind of shitty. Like, I, somebody I, comes to you with something that scary. And, okay, Bill doesn't sound like somebody who would make something like that up. No, no. Bad decision, he, principal he said, man. you need to talk to the sheriff. He should have sat there and got on the phone with the sheriff with the kid. Well, Bill... Oh, absolutely. <laughs> F you, principal. All right, Bill called the sheriff. A squad car picked him up right away after making the call. At the station, he shared everything that he'd known following this Good Friday exchange. Mm -hmm. And one of the deputies that was present chimed in with his own Wayne encounter story. He said, You know, last night, we found Wayne under a bridge out in Milltown. He had some kind of altar set up, a small fire. And, he, and he'd killed some cats. So basically the whole satanic panic done. is his I, fault. Mm -hmm. 
sacrificed him, I guess. He was completely naked, <laughs> buck naked, and was playing with himself, masturbating, and appeared like he was in some kind of trance. Hmm. Uh, what a f***ing dork. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little... I mean, really? He's trying real hard. Days later, during biology class, while dissecting a leopard frog, Wayne told his lab partner, you know, I'm the sheriff's number one suspect. Seeming pretty proud of his police interest, he did say that he didn't do it, though. But, I mean, I think if uh, my lab but partner... If I did. <laughs> okay, we're not O.J. Simpsoning this. Eventually, Wayne was pulled out of class and escorted over 200 miles away to Great Falls to take a lie detector test. But before he was, Wayne actually visited a lawyer named... There's no way it's Ronald McDonald, and I didn't catch that Oh, before. Ron McDonald. No, he's... My parents knew him real well. He Wayne had visited a lawyer named Grimace. Pardon me, Ronald McDonald. They were in pursuit of any evidence that might enable them to charge the Hamburglar with capital crime. <laughs> no. they, they ran the McNugget kids in one at a time. Oh, God. Well, he visited this lawyer named Ronald McDonald on three occasions following the murder of Donna Pounds, always by himself and always full of questions on all aspects of polygraphs. Questions like, could it be beaten? Do... Drugs and alcohol affected. Does the proficiency of the operators affect it? Jesus, think about how hard it would have been to, to beat a polygraph before the internet. Oh, wow. Yeah, you have to hire a lawyer well, three yeah, times. Yeah. yeah, asked everything about the process, and Ron was more concerned about physical evidence and the content of the satanic materials that he was reading. He actually asked Wayne to bring in some of these materials, and although eventually Wayne did request Ronald McDonald to represent him, Ronald denied. I think he had a hunch. That's weird because that law firm's never denied representing him. But anybody. all of this wouldn't really matter anyway. Both Harvey Pounds and Wayne were hooked up and interrogated. For Harvey, the results were inconclusive. And Wayne passed. Yeah, that's why you can't use lie detectors, yeah? Mm. By late May, all leads had cooled down. No fingerprints were identified on a bloody glove that was found down the road from the Pounds house. A pubic hair found at the crime scene had been misplaced. No hardware store in town sold the rope that matched what was found in the house. And because Wayne's bloody underwear was washed, they couldn't determine the blood type. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's no DNA. Like, if they no. can't do the blood type, I mean, you have like a whatever it is, like a one in, you know. Sure is blood. Ten chance of it being right or whatever it is. Yeah. Like ballistic fingerprinting, there wasn't that. You mm -hmm. just, well, it's the same caliber. Wayne never needed to hire an attorney. And on June 19th, 1974, days after graduation, he joined the Navy and left town. Wow. And next week, we'll pick up there. Oh, my God. Discussing his post-grad mayhem in part two of Wayne Nance, the Missoula Mauler. This is so much fun, B. Well, it's about our town. I gotta say. Uh, what a piece of shit. Hurt. I'm not gonna say fun, Byron, but I'm gonna say it's real interesting. Well, I'm happy to hear that. I've been in a bit of a dark place at hurting my back and to... I, I gotta say, researching a serial killer is unsettling, but also being in the places this person was is, makes it. It's yeah, weird. I, I looked up some of the addresses. Our county sheriff has a PDF with like some quick facts about the case because I'm sure they get a lot of questions about it still. And I was, you know, googling some of the locations. It's like, wow, my bus went by the Tamarack. Yeah. My bus went by that every day. Cobblestone apartments. I didn't really grow up in a cult and wasn't educated there. I, my elementary school was what? Which was also Wayne's elementary Whoa. school. Whoa. I'm freaking out right now. Sam? I know, right? Oh, I'm, I'm happy you guys enjoy yourselves. I hope people at home aren't too grossed out by what Wayne did. But next week, it gets worse. It gets worse. It yeah, does. Hey, they found the bodies of at least three young boys. Six more bodies under the John Gacy house. And One longtime acquaintance describes Dahmer as... One weird dude. Stay tuned for Byron Serial Corner. You don't even sound excited about it anymore. Real quick, before we get started, I totally forgot to mention last week, my source for most of the information in this series comes from a book by John Costin titled To Kill and Kill Again. This is a book that Sam and Kelly actually got me for my birthday a couple years ago. 
It was Sam. I just put my name on it. Yeah, you paid some money, I would imagine. You yeah. have a joint account. Yeah, but it was, honestly, we need to give Sam the credit. All right, Sam, I, thanks yeah. for finding Sorry. Oh, my God, just talk about the murders. Well, I will have a Amazon link in the show notes of this episode of Friday.com. Where we last left off, Wayne Nance had seemingly successfully pulled off the grotesque rape and execution of Donna Pounds all before he was even out of high school. He had passed his final exams, passed a polygraph test, joined the Navy, and left Missoula, Montana. And the first year following Wayne's enlistment went great. His record was spotless. He was an exceptional sailor. The sailor? He was in the Navy. I just, he like, sailed? I don't know. He was a seaman. And back home, following a brief uptick in rumors, things like a university student being sacrificed, that actually they just went off on an unannounced California vacation. There was a bridge suicide cult escape that was simply just a tragic suicide due to personal problems and probably mental illness. The discovery of mysterious altars that... This is actually pretty interesting. Turned out to have been built by a semi-secret student forestry society in the 1930s called the Druids. Well, we do have like one of the best forestry schools in the country. And they have all sorts of hilarious joke groups, secret meetings, and get-togethers, and pranks. I bet they were probably really cool people. I bet they're the only fun people on campus at that time. And uh, wood alcohol overdose deaths of kids who were thought to be satanic worshippers. They were actually just, uh, they just died because they were drinking wood alcohol. Weird. Which is not to be confused with ethyl alcohol. The devil's in the details. Well, yes. I mean, the devil was in our town, but our little satanic panic was starting to settle down. Was it? It actually was, yeah. But behind the scenes, Missoula County Prosecutor Dusty Deshaw, who I know I haven't mentioned yet, but he really is a significant presence in this investigation. As the chief law enforcement officer of the county, he was actually the first person on the scene at the Pounds house, and he wasn't done digging. The only problem was that he didn't have enough to charge anyone in the Pounds murder, the McGinnis murder, or two other open murder cases. He didn't want to do a coroner's inquest because it would have been a public proceeding, and at this point, his only option was to summon a grand jury. Oh, I thought you were going to summon something else. No. I thought that was going cool route there. We're not there. that far back in the annals of, mm-hmm. of legal well, history. Well, too bad. The order was signed on May 19th, 1976, with Deshaw planning to personally handle the questioning of all the witnesses to the murder investigation. More than 100 witnesses were called friends of the deceased, relatives, teachers, friends, and acquaintances of the prime suspects, and of course, the prime suspects themselves, Harvey Pounds and Wayne Nance. Are you going to tell us where Harvey Pounds is these days? I could give you a brief update. Okay. I mean, just interested. He ended up dating that woman who he was having an affair with. And, I mean, interestingly enough, her husband died in a plane crash. Really? Yeah. Did he, like, make it go down? I don't believe so, unless maybe they prayed for it. Oh, I mean, that does happen sometimes. And I believe they ended up settling somewhere in Washington. Oh, like they ended up together. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. It's nice when people get together, find each other in this awful world. Is that nice? Seems like that's not nice in this circumstance. Wayne was flown from San Diego, where he was training as an electrician on, on the USS Robinson, back home, where the proceedings were taking place in the Missoula courthouse. And while he was sitting in a small room next to the hearing... In came an old friend. Oh, no. It was Bill Van Kennigan, who, of course, was called as a witness. Well, yeah. And Wayne angrily asked him, why are you here, Bill? And Bill Bill. (laughs) Bill responded, I don't know, Wayne, sarcastically. Apparently, they connect you with pounds, and they want to ask me about your character. Maybe they think, you know something? And if it wasn't such a serious matter, I would think this is a very annoying conversation. Yes, I agree. I dislike it. It's okay. Bill sat quietly and stared out the window and listened to the trial. Uh, They questioned Wayne for hours, presenting him with graphic images, trying to rattle him. Each time, Wayne showed no emotion. He had no reaction. Uh, Where were you the afternoon of April 11th, 1974? Dusty asked. He responded, at home. Mm, But that's not true. No, it was kind of true. Um, Remember, he had missed school the day of the murder. Oh, right. And his excuse was that he was working on an anthropology project for class. The assignment was to make a tomahawk. Oh, my God. Are you serious? Yeah, they were doing a lesson on ancient weapons systems. And his teacher, Mr. Cooper, I bet he has some regrets about that. I definitely have to say that Missoula's public schools definitely started to suck at some point fairly quickly (laughs) after that. Deshaw yelled, you're a liar. And Wayne, 
said nothing. Really? He, he didn't even wince. And after all was said and done, after they talked to all 100 witnesses, Deshaw told reporters, I was in hopes, but I agree with the jury's decision to not indict anybody. Wow. The grand jury uh, trial was over. Is that a trial? Proceedings? The grand jury. I think it's just the grand jury. The grand jury was over. Was, yeah. And Wayne returned to the USS Robinson where his clean record quickly dirtied. Uh-oh. Actually, the dirt pile had already started to form a little bit before he was called in. On November 5th, 1975, two days after he arrived at a nuclear prototype school in Idaho Falls. What is that even? Sam, what does a nuclear prototype yeah, tell me mean? what that is. So it was a nuclear prototype school. I wonder if it was kind of like <laughs> they were they were doing a proof of concept on teaching people about like nuclear stuff. Mm-hmm. The only reason I say that, like, like the Idaho Wayne right now. Well, I did, Idaho National Laboratories is, is is right down there. Some very significant advancements in our nuclear technology happened in Idaho in Arco, and it's like one of the first nuclear breeder reactors. I think it's mm, probably decommissioned, but INL Idaho National Laboratories is a huge energy player that dabbles heavily in nuclear. So it, it makes sense that they would have I don't know maybe chartered a school in Idaho Falls or something. I don't know. I'm gonna go on a limb and say that you know more about this than Wayne did because he was there for two <laughs> days. Because, oh, nuclear. Mm. No, 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 I'm out. He was kicked out for having, quote, demonstrated unreliability. Oh, M- maybe he was just okay. late. I don't know. Interesting. Showed up. They just kept missing plutonium. Some of it like fell out of his pocket when he was getting a piece of gum. He's well, I don't know. Is that Homer Simpson? Post subpoena on September 13th, 1977, he was caught hanging out with Mary Jane. Puffing on jazz cigarettes, smoking marijuana. Yeah, the reefer madness. Is jazz cigarettes jazz actually cigarettes. like a name for them? Yeah, and for this, he was bumped down in rank, forced to forfeit $200 pay, and restricted for 14 days. Which, I, what does that mean, Sam, to be restricted when you're in the armed services? Uh, I don't know. Maybe you're, in prison. Yeah, like maybe you can't leave like the barracks or something. I don't know. Can't be good. And just two days after this restriction was lifted, he was caught getting lifted again. High on weed. God, this guy is just stupid. Well, he also had LSD, two illegal butterfly knives, and a pair of stolen Navy binoculars on him. Okay, so all three of those things sound way worse than getting caught smoking weed. Yeah, I guess. Well, they all kind of go together because, I mean, when you're stoned, flipping a knife around, staring at the stars with binocular. I mean, as long as he's alone, maybe he would have killed himself at that point. We all would have saved ourselves some trouble. Uh. Wayne, the rifle lockers are right next to the binocular. Why <laughs> Why did you just, you know... Wayne's not a smart man. He actually was smart, unfortunately. I know. His rank was further reduced. He was fined $300 and now restricted for another 30 days. But the end of Wayne's military career would soon follow when he was given a, quote, general discharge by reason of misconduct on November 29th, 1977, Wayne was headed home with his tail between his legs and a stolen Navy telescope in his duffel bag. What an idiot. That'll that'll teach him. This guy is the dumbest son of a bitch. Uh, He moved back in with his parents. And made a bong out of the telescope. (laughs) That's actually pretty funny. Uh, Did he? He didn't, did he? Back to the, no, back to the trailer park. Surrounded by his past, he decided to try to return to something he was good at. Macrame. Killing people. School. Oh. He had plans to enroll at the University of Montana in the fall, but he had decided to have a little fun first. Wayne would now drive west to Seattle, Washington to spend time with a Navy buddy and maybe make some new friends. So had this Navy buddy also gotten kicked out of the Navy? I don't know. This definitely sounds like it's headed a Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer direction. July 1978. Devonna Nelson, a small 15-year-old girl... 100 pounds soaking wet with strawberry blonde hair disappeared without a trace. Her parents were going through a messy divorce and uh, simply thought that she had run away. In fact, her brother had helped her pack a bag. She kind of had run away, but she wasn't alone. Years later, a slow-moving freight train spotted human remains leaning against a chain-link fence along I-90. The body was almost entirely skeletonized at this point hair having completely separated from the skull looking more like a hairpiece now that had fallen to the side there were no shoes no underwear 
earrings and other jewelry were found. It appeared that the cause of death was a stab wound to the chest. Do we know where this was along I-90? 15 miles outside of Missoula. Okay. Uh, This then unidentified girl was dubbed the Beaver Tail Hill Girl, which was a reference to the site where she was found. She had been transported hundreds of miles and carelessly tossed down a road bank. And this trip matched up with Wayne's return. Weird. Unexpected. Vacation in the rear view, Wayne entered higher education, and for a while he did well. He maintained a 3.53 GPA. Oh, serial killer and a show off. I I really, really hate Wayne. He, He did get a couple bad grades. He got an F in modern fantasy English, as well as introduction to women. Oh, God. Not surprised. And in 1978, that class actually consisted of introducing yourself (laughs) to women. Again, after a good run, things would start to sour, but this time it wasn't his fault. On April... Uh, I wrote April Ford because I had third there before. (laughs) I changed the three to a four. (laughs) Oh, that's fun. I'm not tired. Uh, On April 4th, 1980, a tired George Nance, Wayne's father, returned home from a several days long haul Remember, he's a logging trucker. Oh, yes. It was after midnight, and in his mind, however cliche, all he wanted was his lazy boy, a beer, and some TV. You know, sitcom stuff. Right. But when he pulled up, his wife's car was not there, and he was pretty pissed about this. He headed towards where he knew that she would be, a little western bar called The Cabin, the place where she worked part-time and hung out often. I tried to find if the cabin was still open, and I couldn't find any information on it. I, I would hazard a guess here that all of our parents probably drank it. I don't know where, where it is or was. But it's in I would, East Missoula, would, yes. but I would imagine yeah. at that you don't, time. What if it's just changed names? That is possible. I know it's over by the Reno Inn. I was just going to ask. Mm-hmm. It's proximity to that fine establishment. Yeah. After arriving, they had a heated fight. George insisted that she come home, saying that she was drunk. She snapped back, dismissing that she was drunk and refusing to leave. They took their fight outside, and Charlene yelled her way to her 1976 Chrysler Cordoba. I wanted you to say LeBaron. No, I'm so sorry. You're not going to get any Freddy fingered from me today. Okay, that's all right. She burnt out and headed east. George tried to follow her but couldn't keep up. She disappeared from sight, and he decided to turn around and go home. An hour later, George heard a car pull up into his driveway He listened for her to open the door, but heard a knock instead. Uh Uh-oh. It was two sheriff's deputies, and there had been an accident. That's what happens when you drive drunk, kids. I mean, yes, but... Just saying. Just two miles outside East Missoula, Charlene, still driving at a high rate of speed, slammed head-on into a Ponderosa pine. Better than another car. You can't keep being mean to her. I'm sorry. She didn't do anything wrong. Well, no, but the point is she could have killed somebody else by driving drunk, and at least she didn't. Well, let's mourn her for a second. I mean, she did give birth to... (sighs) She split her Cordoba in half. Ooh, that's a lot of steel. She would have been driving a LeBaron. She would have been fine. (laughs) All right. There was no sign that she even tried to break. She died instantly. Her death was later designated a suicide. A month later... George's father passed away, another tragedy in his life, but it also presented an opportunity to move out of the trailer park and into his... I don't remember. He was probably old. It was not Wayne's dad. Wayne's dad's dad. Oh, sorry. Got it. They decided to move into Wayne's grandfather, George's father's modest ranch home on Minnesota Avenue in East Missoula. Mm. Do you know where that is? Yep. I do because we lived in Montana, which is very close to Minnesota. What block down? I think maybe two. And a stone's throw from the cabin where Wayne's mom used to work, and where Wayne soon would follow, becoming a bouncer after he dropped out of school. Oh my God. Spring turned to summer, and summers in Missoula can get hot. A little, yeah. Denise Tate was returning home on July 3rd. When she pulled up, her windows were open, and so was the front door, which was fine. She had, she had left them that way in the hopes that a breeze would cool down her hot trailer, and it had worked. It was pretty comfortable inside, but what she would find next would give her the bad kind of chills. <sighs> ropes were tied to her bedposts. God, he loves those ropes. Denise froze and listened. Nothing. Alarmed but exhausted, she decided to turn in and call the sheriff. Are you kidding me? In the morning. 
which after a good night's it's been sleep, a long day. Tomorrow morning, this, this is, is going to seem like such a more manageable problem. Why would you ever do any of these things? When she woke up, she called the sheriffs, and they were pretty disappointed to hear that she had casually discarded the ropes before calling. Oh my god! I mean, I don't know how much was publicly known at this point. It doesn't even matter. She didn't know how lucky she was. When sheriffs asked her what the ropes looked like and how they were tied, they had been tied and placed exactly the same way they were in Donna Pound's house. They were super Nancy. I find it difficult to believe that someone who would have ignored those ropes and untied them and went to bed probably has absolutely no idea what they looked like. I mean, they could have easily been just described as those noose knots. Later that same summer in August of 1984, a 5'4", heavyset girl with recently dyed auburn hair and perfect teeth leaves a truck that she had been hitching in and walks across the street towards a bar hmm. where a bouncer in a tight, sleeveless, I'm sorry, Sam, Star Wars shirt welcomed her in and bought her a drink. You seem creepy, but he oh, did have Darth no, Vader no, no, no. on his shirt. After some conversation and flirting, the subject of where she'd be ending her night comes up, and Wayne Nance, this man, invites her to his house. A co-worker named Julie Slocum, who had a crush on Nance, took notice. Hold on, how do you spell Julie? J-U-L-I-E. I'm wondering if I think this might be the mother of a kid that I went oh, to school God. with. You know them all. Yeah, I think I do. She wasn't exactly just a coworker. They were actually drinking buddies and would frequently go to the cinema and they'd puff that sweet green leaf together. Oh my God. There this is, is grim. a recurring theme in all these murders. Do not drive and drunk. It is the demon leaf. At least it wasn't cocaine. Yeah. This hitchhiker and Wayne actually started dating. Even though she wasn't traditionally Wayne's type, he would constantly be talking about petite, blue-haired, blonde girls. This girl wasn't that. And that, I guess, would make sense with what happened next. This relationship was kept on the down low because Wayne was also dating an 18-year-old girl oh my God. who had just graduated from Big Sky High School. What was her name? She was actually the daughter of a local country singer named Jan Dell. Her name was Joni Dell. Mm. She thought of him as the, quote, kindest man she'd ever met, the kind of guy she'd like to marry someday. He always brought her flowers. They went to the movies on picnics, would watch her mom perform at the cabin where he worked. He painted pictures of her as gifts and carved her name on a rock. And after the first time that they had sex together, which I believe was her first time. This is getting ugh. more and more depressing. He finished quickly, got dressed, and said goodbye with no eye contact, acting embarrassed. Soon after, in September, they met up, and Wayne started to cry. He said, I'm getting too serious about you. I don't like how I feel when you aren't with me. I'm not the type to have a family, and I don't like being so serious with somebody. We have to break up. And then he started blubbering like a crybaby. This is... I know we hate all these guys, but man, I hate this guy. And she played it cool. I mean, bravo to her. She should have just slit his throat. Okay. Did I mention the, the hitchhiker's name? She went by Robin. We don't have a last name, though. I have her full name. It wasn't Robin. And we'll get to that. Oh, okay. All right. I'll hold my horses. The last time anyone saw... I was going to say older girlfriend, but she was 16. So what am I talking about? God, this guy's so much worse than I thought. The last time anyone saw Wayne's other girlfriend, everyone knew her as Robin, was on the night of September 28th, 1984. She had accompanied Wayne to a party. It was his coworker Julie's birthday party. And after that, friends noticed a much more bummed out Wayne. And so did his coworkers. Because you see, Wayne wasn't only a bouncer at the cabin. His day job was as a warehouse and delivery man at a large furniture store called Conlin's, which miraculously is still open today. Is it? Yeah. yeah. It's so funny. I didn't even realize that. There will most likely be a selfie of me in front of Conlin's <gasps> in the we show should, notes. Let's, let's all go do one. Yeah, we'll take a lunch break. That'd be I fun. I love it. Conlin's co-workers poked at him asking, where's Robin? And he just responded, she's gone. Oh my god. Eventually continuing, I put her on a bus after more prodding. I put her on a on bus. A bus. Hmm. It was after this breakup that Julie was allowed into Wayne's room. And once inside, she noticed a lot. Oh god. Um, a collection of birds' feet, medieval weaponry, 
Knives lined in rows on tabletops and in drawers. Swords. Swords? Hung up on the wall. Did she count them? I don't think she counted, but a lot. Okay. Handmade weapons like clubs with nails hammered through. All of this would be great if you were living in a a post-apocalyptic zombie world. But he wasn't. No. Uh, Brass knuckles and many bottles of vitamins. No nunchucks? I was really waiting for the nunchucks. I would imagine there were nunchucks somewhere. They were just hidden. She didn't see them. There was also a lot of junk. Felt tip markers, toothbrushes, a plastic bust of a black woman, the Navy telescope, weights, opened and sealed porno mags, and small Mm. tabletop shrines. He also had a collection of fake detective badges. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow. And on his shelf were many paperbacks on the occult, mythology, Satanism, and Viking literature. The only window in his room was covered by a black sheet, and on the walls were maps, both drawn and commercial, of Missoula and surrounding towns. Some handmade were of local trailer parks and apartment complexes, layouts of homes. And taped to his dresser, he had a newspaper clipping of an ad showing a group of women hairdressers at a local beauty parlor, circles drawn around some of their faces. There were also posters of Conan the Barbarian and quotes from Leonard Niebuhr. What? At Conlin, he also had posters of Conan the Barbarian. Strange fascination with that character. Do you know uh, what year was this? Are we talking now? This is 1984. See, so what year did Conan come out? I don't know. I'm going to be impressed if he was actually into the novels. His collection of cassette tapes nearly filled the entire wall. And speaking of cassette tapes... The Roswell Incident, a Captain Kelly special presentation is still available on neon green cassettes at shop.frightday.com. Woo! Perfect for your summer road trips. Not good if it's in your house and you're a killer. So don't buy it. Yeah, I do not want to be tied to any of that. Nah. Or toss that awesome green case away and slip the cassette within into an empty Dawkin cassette case. Oh, tight. And then put it back up on the shelf. That's no know. pretty cool. Of course, I'll see you have a Dawkin tape and then they'll just assume that you kill people. It's another problem. Don't do that either. Beneath his comforter, he slept on a green rubber sheet. Okay, I... There's such thing as a rubber sheet? Yeah, typically in uh, nursing homes. White (laughs) clothesline restraints hung on his bedposts. Apparently he was practicing on himself. Extremely weird and wicked stuff. Maybe it was all this weirdness that caused ex-girlfriend Robin to leave town. Mm Mm-hmm. But of course, Robin hadn't left. No. She was buried nude, face up in a two-foot-deep grave less than three miles away from Wayne's home above Bonner Dam, shot once in the back of the head and twice in the temple. God. Christmas Eve, 1984, a wildlife photographer was taking full advantage of a fresh snow when something caught his eye. Walking closer, he noticed something sticking out of the ground. Uh Uh-oh. It was black, and it wasn't until he was right up to it that he recoiled in shock. It was a blackened human leg, (gasps) knee, ankle, and foot, jutting out of the frozen ground at a 45 degree angle. Why is it black, guys? I don't understand this. Well, (sighs) your blood pools, and then the rot takes over. Let's just say when you die, you turn black. Got it. Okay. Eventually. He rushed home to call the sheriff. Captain Weatherman knew this spot from its reputation as a kegger location. It was, it was the place to drink and trip out. Really? Yeah. Okay. They plunged through the snow up to the site. He knew he would need a tent and heater to thaw the ground. And after acquiring and setting it up with little daylight left and Christmas being the next day, he was forced to make a pretty awful decision. And that was to push the excavation to the 26th. I mean, at that point, what what difference does it make? Well, I mean... If you're the family. Picture this body by itself in a tent with nothing but the hum of an electric heater keeping it company. I mean, I agree. It's really horrible. But, I mean, another day is not going to make a hell of a lot of difference. When they returned, they still had to chisel the body from the ground. The heater didn't do much. They quickly determined the sex of the victim as the breasts were still intact uh, and they found that the skull was fractured from the impact of bullet wounds 
but no bullets were recovered. Weird. Most likely, the woman was killed somewhere else and dumped there. It appeared that she wasn't dead for longer than three months. And during this time, there were no reports of missing people that matched her description, leading Captain Weatherman to believe that she was from out of town, and he decided to call this Jane Doe Debbie Deercrick. Oh, yeah. Dory Schmidt had recently moved into a one-bedroom apartment, part of a three-unit building in East Missoula, by herself. But this night, Bill, her on-again, off-again husband, not Van Canigan, different Bill. Hold on, wait, on-again, off-again husband? They had a complicated relationship. Okay. He had a bit of an alcohol problem and wasn't staying with her at the time. Okay. But this night was different. She received a phone call. She ended up picking him up drunk from a bar. And around midnight, she was actually awoken by Bill shouting, You son of a bitch! What are you doing in this apartment? Confused, she sat up to see an outline of a wild head of curly hair in her doorway. Bill continued, Me and my wife don't need you in this apartment. This man answered, Oh, I got the wrong place. And Bill replied, in a, in a way that Kelly might enjoy, Get the Sam Hill out of here. <laughs> yes. And the man turned around and was out of sight. Um, After a second of listening, the couple laid back down. Things were different back then. Yeah. Oh, that was weird. Uh, Drunk Bill snoozed, but Dory laid awake. After a while, she heard the sound of her castered couch hit the wall. He hadn't left. So Bill got up, grabbed the man who was half awake on the couch, and physically showed him the door. The next morning, they found this man huddled outside, sleeping with his jacket around him like a blanket, and they would later learn that this man, although she didn't see his face, she only saw his hair, was Wayne Nance, which, even more chilling, she had been alone in the house for three days prior to this uh, break-in. She couldn't help but wonder what would have happened if her husband wasn't there that night. Mm. On April 27th, 1983, Janet Wicker returned home from work to the cobblestone apartment just oh. east out of missoula proper they're yeah. still there to this day sure are it was getting dark by the time she arrived home she unlocked the front door and as she was stepping in she was running her hand on the wall attempting to locate the light switch and she was grabbed from out of the darkness oh my god a masked man who had climbed up her balcony was waiting for her she screamed and he told her to shut up and that all he wanted was money and she continued to resist. He hit her with his fist and knocked her to the floor, but she kept fighting. He said, shut up or I'll stab you, as he unsheathed the knife that was on his belt. He walked her upstairs at knife point, and right as they arrived at the top of the stairs, the front door opened. Wait, what? Her husband was home. Man, husbands have never been this useful. And just like that, the man bolted for the balcony, jumped off, and disappeared into the darkness. Remember those maps? Yeah, the maps of the apartment complexes that were Mm hand-drawn? Mm-hmm. One of those hand-drawn maps was of this complex. Of the cobblestones? Mm Mm-hmm. Ooh. On the afternoon of September 9th, the same year, a bear hunter stumbled upon an orb-shaped fragment among the rocks of a creek bed. It was the top of a human skull. Later that day, deputies followed him to the location where they hoped to find more and they did. They found almost all of a human skeleton with only a femur off-site nearby that animals had gotten to. Oh my gosh. The skull showed two bullet holes, one in the back and one in the temple. Two 32 caliber slugs were found at the site. The remains were smaller than Debbie Deer Creek, and the victim was believed to be between the ages of 20 and 22 shorter she was only five foot to five foot two no clothing or personal items were found this woman was shot stripped left naked on the ground and the sheriffs called her christy crystal creek so depressing i don't really like that name christy crystal creek is really hard to say hold on the deer creek one you're okay with debbie deer creek i mean say crystal christy crystal creek three times fast well i mean i guess my more significant problem would be with like Flippant names for dead women. Well, it's better than Jane Doe. I don't know. The location of the body was only three miles southeast of the Bonner Dam where Debbie was discovered. 
Around this time, Wayne had a really great night. <laughs> Wayne had a special visitor at the cabin, someone who he'd never expected to show up. A petite, blue-eyed woman who he'd become increasingly infatuated with. It was his boss at Conlin's, Chris Wells, and right behind her was a group of her friends, as well as her husband, Doug. This is not going in a good direction. Doug was born into a family that functioned under the motto, you work, that's what you do. And out of high school, he started doing that almost immediately. He started a small trucking company that moved sawdust. He eventually left to attend college with a major in forestry, which ended up bringing him to Montana. He fell in love with the recreation opportunities, hunting, fishing, but that's not all he fell in love with. After a while, several moves and changes in career, he convinced his hometown crush, Chris, to pack up and move to Missoula. The two were married in 1979, continuing his family tradition, becoming a very hardworking couple. Doug finally focused his interests, becoming a gunsmith, and he started a business called Lock, Stock, and Barrel. Not Did, a lot of imagination He should have that. sued Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels when they came out with that movie. I bet he could have gotten something. Chris hustled, working at a department store, then as a flooring cabinet and wallpaper salesperson, ending up at Conlon's Furniture, where she would be promoted to sales manager in less than two years. They were doing well recently having bought a new house at the edge of town, which is not quite the edge of town anymore. Where was it? It was off of Reserve Street down River Road. Oh, yeah. No, that's definitely not edge of town anymore. New house. Their careers were going great. They were happy. Nevertheless, Wayne did very little to hide his feelings for Chris. The back of the warehouse at Conlon's was full of evidence. He had drawn, remember he's a great artist, Great. a huge KZ on the wall. This is how she initialed her orders, Chris Zimmerman being her given name. In trucks and in the back room, employees would often have to endure repeated conversations about how much he wished Chris liked him and how much he didn't like Doug, that he was conceited, which he never did anything to Wayne that would give him reason to feel that way. He was just a quiet guy. Well, Wayne just didn't like that he was married to a lady he liked. One coworker recalled Wayne saying once, if he ever did anything to hurt Chris, I'd kill him. Well. We'll talk more about his time at Conlin's another time, but back at the cabin, they had just left a wine tasting party and approached Wayne saying, we thought we'd show our friends visiting from California a real cowboy bar. So here we are. Wayne waved their cover fee and said to Chris, hey, save a dance for me. Okay, can I pause you for a second? What a uh-huh. creep. Okay, like, is there any testimony as to how much she knew he was obsessed with her or was she like totally unaware of this like what's we'll, our status here? we'll get into that okay the group settled in this was very much a real cowboy bar but according to the book to kill and kill again quote it was a friday night mecca for secretaries dental hygienists and assistant store managers so they could have something to brag about on monday morning sounds about right that kind of place Eventually, Chris told her husband, I'm going to ask Wayne to dance. And Doug wasn't a jealous guy. He was used to his wife dancing with other men. He didn't like dancing. Hmm, I know that feeling. But he responded, I don't know if I would egg him on. I wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. Not this guy. Uh, Sensing it would mean a lot more to Wayne than it would to his wife. Oh, smart man. She danced anyway. Mm. And the next day at work... Wayne entered her office. He said, I have something for you. Handed her a small handmade card painted in watercolor. Wayne had drawn a near naked woman posed with her legs up inside of a wine glass. At the bottom, he had written first wine tasting. What a douche. Yeah, she was embarrassed and offended, but didn't know how to react. So she threw it away as soon as he left the room. What was Wayne going to do with all this unrequited love that's building up? You'll have to tune in next week for the shocking conclusion of Wayne Nance, the Missoula Mauler. I bet he channels it into his art. We'll we'll talk more about art, but I know last week I warned you that things were going to get worse. But that's next week? Next week is going to be worse. and You're going to hate next week. No, it's okay. It's okay. Honestly, as long as I'm prepared for it and as Mm -hmm. long as the listeners are enjoying it, Mm -hmm. I'll be just 
Fine. More workplace weirdness, a few examples of why you should always pick up your own furniture, and you haven't heard the last from Chris and Doug. Okay, Chris and Doug. It's going to be a rough episode. Thanks, B. Oh, you're very welcome. I really hope everybody's enjoying this. Byron's <laughs> really hurting himself for it. I so. got it. Yeah, I mean, whew, it does take a toll, I'm finding out. Of course it does. It's a good thing that it does, Byron. I'd be worried about you if it didn't. Well, Byron, you know what those are called? Uh, what? What? Feelings. Yeah. Fire emergency. Please don't talk to me. I'm sorry. I can't. Hey, they found the bodies of at least three young boys. Six more bodies under the John Gacy house. And one longtime acquaintance describes Dahmer as one weird dude. Stay tuned for Byron Serial Corner. Last episode, Jane Doe started stacking up surrounding the residence of Wayne Nance, following his discharge from the Navy and the tragic loss of his mother. Now he spends his days as a warehouse worker at a furniture store, and his nights bouncing at the cowboy bar his dead mother used to work at, resting his head at the home he shared with his father, George. After what could have been a scene from a romance movie, a dance with the woman of his dreams, his boss, Chris Wells, a gift given the following day wasn't well received and would lead us to a shocking conclusion. Today's episode, Kelly, is not pretty. Okay, you really do need to warn me with some earmuffs. It's not hilarious like no. the last couple. <laughs> well, we, made the, we, we made the best of it, but no, this is this is pretty Yeah, I mean, we, we laugh and we make fun of it because that's all you can do. Like, this is, yeah. this is awful stuff. It is. Very awful. Awful like uh, buying furniture. No, 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 no. Buying I furniture, mean, it wasn't always as easy as it is today, Sam. He hates it even today. He I would, I would. About really? It. Yeah, yeah, I would rather. Get I mean, back then there, there wasn't Wayfair. Strangled by a serial killer. <laughs> yeah, you could, no <laughs> Amazon, Wayfair. no overstock. No. And in the 1980s in Missoula, Montana, it seemed like everyone at one time or another was buying furniture at a big showroom style location called Conlon's. Yeah. Whose mission to this day is to, quote, provide an outstanding customer service experience through a family of knowledgeable and caring associates. And I'm just going to scroll past that Google ad and go ahead and <laughs> click on overstock.com. Oh, Support no. local businesses. Local businesses are great. Yes. Most of the employees at this location were outstanding. They were a great group of yeah. hard workers, True. people who did care. And although Wayne certainly was hardworking, he wasn't the kind of coworker you'd like to have. But on the outside, he wasn't far from the kind of coworker that most of us had. While researching Wayne and this time in his life, I couldn't help but remember a guy that I actually used to work with at the airport. Uh, he wanted to be a cop, but told us for some reason that he couldn't pass the psych test. Oh, that's not a they good sign. They say I'm too awesome. Well, he constantly would be in his car listening to his police scanner. He still lived with his dad, and he would uh, every once in a while threaten to kill us with his gun. Okay. Now I actually believe he's an armed security guard that works for one of those money trucks. Yeah, that makes sense. That, I think, is the exact profile of an armed security guard. You just described they were like mm, could you relate an average day uh in your life and he says exactly what you said and they go here's a here's gun, a gun. Uh -huh. there's a truck full of money just go right around in oh, it i wonder where that guy is anyway co-workers recalled some things about wayne he was constantly changing his appearance letting his hair grow out then buzzing it off he had a mustache goatee a fu manchu he was clean shaven he had wireframe glasses thick plastic they were tinted some were clear and he dressed like a shithead. Dude, that picture that we have actually posted in our group at Friday.club, our Facebook group. Mm, Facebook.com slash group slash Friday. I don't think we own Friday.club anymore, unfortunately. Oh, I he looks, know. I could get it back. He looks like a guy that maybe doesn't play in Merle Haggard's band uh, at that time, but maybe yeah. looks like he tunes the band's instruments yeah, before the show he's off and to the left for <laughs> sure he had headbands of flared blue jeans and he always had a knife on his side that he would use to cut the strings off of the boxes but never used on cardboard which seems like something sam would do you don't want to dull a plane on cardboard oh no it's very abrasive you can actually sharpen well i mean not well but you can actually hone a knife on cardboard <laughs> wayne took his job very seriously he was always the first to punch in would never do anything personal on company time and would often work through his lunch Although he always had in his hand a, a Coke and a candy bar from the vending machine, he would use that Coke to chase down the numerous vitamins that he was taking. 
he would see a full truck pull up and say things like, let's turn this into a workout. You carry the weight on one side, then you shift and carry it on the other. Try to work yourself on both sides. The body is an instrument. And any downtime he had was spent doing pull-ups and push-ups in the back room. You know how you get to a point when you're learning about these terrible people and you're like, man, there's nothing anyone could say that would make <laughs> me hate him more or just be more disgusted by him as a person. Sam, let's turn this into a workout. You just did it. But he was often short with his coworkers, especially when he felt like they weren't pulling their weight. Okay, so when he was short with them, was it like start pulling your weight or I'm going to shoot you, you know, like your coworker? Yeah. Or was it start pulling your weight, you stupid no, son of a bitch? It was honestly more of like an internal thing. He, he would speak in a way that was threatening, but Ooh. without being threatening. The same kind of okay. way he treated his Taco John's coworkers. Got it. You just kind of had to pay attention to when he was in one of these moods and avoid him when he was. But this isn't where the problems with Wayne would stop obviously. One day, a sales associate suddenly lost a regular customer after Wayne picked up a love seat for repair. The woman had complained that ever since the pickup, she'd been receiving obscene phone calls so frequently, in fact, that she had to change her phone number. And she tied it back to him. Interesting. The saleswoman didn't believe her. However, this wasn't the only customer to have these issues. Other customers would get a delivery and then would be haunted by the same kind of obscene phone Let's calls. Make it a work out. <laughs> okay, well, that's just someone pitching Planet Fitness. Oh, he, he wasn't doing that. I hey, like, man, come in. No, check it out. It's only nine ninety nine. I like to imagine Black Christmas. Remember that? Yep. Oh, yeah. Hello? 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 Hey, quiet. It's him again. The Mona. Yeah, really creepy. One woman actually had to change her phone number twice. Even when it was unlisted, the calls continued. She quit doing business with Conlins, and then the calls stopped. Oddly enough, Wayne always refused to answer the phone at work, most likely because he was worried that people would recognize his voice. One afternoon, a young couple named Teresa and Mike Shook came in, looking to furnish their dream home. It was located on a plot of land in Hamilton, Montana, about an oh. hour south. Yeah. A home they'd personally built, along with the help of their friends and family, nearly 90% of over the course of three years. It's a beautiful house wow. in a beautiful place, perfect for them and their three okay. children. Matt, age seven, Luke, four, and Megan, who was two and a half. Although uh -oh. the <laughs> You didn't like my pause? Yeah. Made you uncomfortable? Although the furniture they selected cost more than what Mike would make in a month as a high school history teacher in Stevensville, they filled out a credit application and their furniture was scheduled to be delivered the following Monday, which was right in time for Thanksgiving. Because no one has ever been turned down for credit application at a furniture store. <laughs> Tossing those applications out. That Mo is very close to where we are right now. It is. It is very, very close. Monday came, Wayne drove, and another employee named Mike rode shotgun. Wayne frequently checked the map while Mike enjoyed the scenery, which it is beautiful. Oh my it's gosh. Great drive. It Especially is. back then. Teresa was home alone to accept the furniture. It was a striped couch, love seat, chair, and ottoman. They loaded everything into the empty living room. The order was signed for, receipt clipped to a clipboard, and the men left. Teresa was ecstatic, and everything seemed great. Pretty much an uneventful delivery. During the drive home, though, Mike noticed Wayne's mood sour. Uh. Upon arrival back at Conlin's, when a saleswoman named Sheila asked how the delivery went, he responded, That Mike Shook is an asshole. What? Oh. Why do you say that? Did he do something to you? She said, no. You know, I used to buy drugs from his brother, who was one of the biggest pushers in the Northwest. His brother was killed by the mafia. Sheila knew this wasn't true. She had family in the area. Mike's brother was very much alive, and he was also a police officer. But what she didn't know is that Mike wasn't even home for the delivery. Several weeks later, on Thursday, December 12th, 1985, 
violence would interrupt the Shook family's night, leaving their family devastated and a community grieving and terrified. This is the point in the episode where I'm going to warn Kelly and other sensitive yes. listeners. Mike was enjoying the expensive furniture that he had just purchased with his teacher's salary, shoes off in front of the TV. Matt, the second grader, was already in bed. The two youngsters were still struggling to find sleep. Uh, they were at the kitchen counter helping their mother, Teresa, punch out cookie dough ornaments for the tree. They were going to get a tree the next day, which was Friday the 13th. I had never understood the cookie ornament thing, though. Oh, I love it. Really? Yeah. Food on the tree? Yeah, I mean, we would make it out of, you, you make, make it a like dough, but, it's, but it's not, it. yeah, yeah, but it's not like an know. edible dough. No, of course, but let's just. Oh, the dog's still going to eat it. They don't even shimmer. Everyone was excited to celebrate their first Christmas at the new house, and as the oven door closed, someone knocked at the door. Neither Mike or Teresa saw headlights in the driveway, and while they looked at each other puzzled, four-year-old Luke was already opening the door. A man pushed himself inside, announcing, I'm Conan the Barbarian. What? Yeah. Remember, he liked Conan. Mike quickly got out of his chair onto his feet. I want money. Stand back. This wild-eyed man had a gun in his hand and a knife on his belt. And no one knows exactly what happened next, but this is what authorities believe did. Teresa is almost immediately shot in the leg, near the ankle. She steadies herself on the kitchen counter, bleeding on the floor, telling her two children, Luke and Morgan, to get behind her. Then the phone rings. Hello? She answered. It was her friend Mary Lake calling to see if she could babysit her son tomorrow. There was an odd hesitancy in Teresa's voice. She didn't really seem to want to talk. Well, are you going to be home tomorrow? Teresa responded, I sure hope so. Oh, God. Megan was heard screaming in the background, and Mary said, It sounds like somebody needs you. She said, Yeah, gotta go by. Hanging up before Mary could respond. Oof. During a struggle, Mike attempted to defend his family with a brass candlestick. Unfortunately, he lost his fight. A severe blow was delivered to Mike's head before or after his attacker managed to tie his arms and legs. The man pulled a knife from his belt and plunged it into Mike's chest, who fell limp on his side, face to the floor, bleeding out. Teresa, although obviously in pain, also grabbed the nearest weapon, which just so happened to be a tennis racket, but that also ended up on the floor next to the candlestick and Mike. The two children, Luke and Megan, watched all of this. Matt was still asleep in the bedroom. At gunpoint, Teresa was led down the hall into the master bedroom. Luke was put in his bedroom, where his brother was sleeping, and Megan was placed into her crib right next to her parents' bed. Teresa was forced into the bed, arms and legs tied to its four corners, where she would later be discovered, a pillow over her face, a towel over the wound on her leg, pants pulled up but unzipped, her bra and underwear on the floor. They'd been cut off her body. She had been raped and then stabbed in the chest, all while her two-and-a-half-year-old daughter watched. And we lost Kelly. Okay, go. You keep going. You keep going. Okay. <clears throat> oh, God. I get it. Go hug your kid. No, do not wake them up. Just go stare at them. That That's was less creepy. An autopsy found that a knife had been used in an attempt to remove the 22 caliber slug that had been left in her leg. It was about 10 p.m. when Wayne Nance abruptly left the Shook house. This was confirmed by a neighbor who witnessed headlights leaving. Oh, it, it, I mean, this is awful, and it's so it's so sad because he was so bad at this. Like, I mean, there were yeah. so many chances for things to just go a little bit off the rails and people could still be alive. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, at this point, he came into the house saying he was Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. There's obviously something way, way wrong with Wayne at this point. Oh, yeah. Welcome back. Sorry about that. Hi, Kel. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Okay. The boys were in the room. Megan was in the parents' room. The parents were dead. Wayne was gone. 
but he wouldn't stay gone for long. As much as two hours later, he returned to the scene, where police believe he spent quite a bit of time. He was digging through drawers, through their personal possessions, and a few things caught his eye. By this point, you know that Wayne can't resist a good knife, and a stag-handled hunting knife and a tanned leather sheath was no exception. He also grabbed a 12-inch plaster statue of a bugling elk, as well as Mike's collection of silver dollars. One of these things is not like the others. At some point during his second visit, Luke woke up and left his room where he saw Conan the Barbarian, who was moving the wooden-legged vinyl upholstered kitchen bar stools under their stairwell. He stuffed newspapers under the seats of the upturned chairs and lit them on fire. Luke ran back to his bedroom to hide. With the fires burning, Wayne walked out the door and closed it tightly behind him, assuming that the fire would finish the job that he started, and clean up the mess that he left behind. But thank goodness, Wayne fucked up. With the doors closed tight, there wasn't enough air for the fire to take off, so it just smoldered most of the night. Matt was a hard sleeper. He had slept through the commotion, including the gunshot. It it was actually the smoke alarm that finally woke him up. Having remembered what firemen taught him during a class on fire safety, he sprung into action, waking up his little brother, then attempting but failing to open the bedroom door. The next thing that came to mind was to get low on the ground, which they did, but suddenly he started feeling tired. Another thing that Wayne hadn't considered, and even more deadly than the potential flame, was the poisonous smoke created by the burning furniture foam. And that's why you don't buy things off of Wayfair. It's all garbage made in China that will kill you. One way or another, it's going to get you. The house was filling with cyanide gas and... This gas couldn't escape. The house that the Shook family built was basically airtight. That's the way ours is, and it, it's, it's dangerous, nice most right? of the time, but then it's a problem, too. Yeah. The chair fire was smoldering, and the wood fire that was keeping the house warm was dying, and the children were falling unconscious. The next morning, family friends Greg and Mary Lakes and their four-year-old son Jesse arrived at 8 a.m. to pick them up for breakfast, only to walk into a nightmare. After receiving no response to knocks at the door, Greg entered first, finding the house full of smoke, Mike in a pool of blood on the floor, the boys semi-conscious in their room, vomit covering their clothes, Teresa covered in blood and a pillow on the bed, her daughter Megan unconscious in the crib. He immediately called the sheriff, thinking this was just a house fire, an accident. And uh, with them on the way, he wrapped the children in blankets. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Blood on the bed and thought it was a house fire. He didn't, I mean, you don't have time to think. That's the thing. Everything is on fire. Like, you don't have time to process all of it. Yeah, he couldn't really put it together. He just thought it was an accident. And he wrapped the children in blankets, got them into fresh air, but it was cold. Oh, God. Everyone would soon discover that this was not an accident. And before you ask Kelly, I know the thing that's on your mind right now. Yes, the kids all made full recoveries. But unfortunately, they couldn't help with the investigation into the death of their parents. Megan was too young, Matt had slept through most of it, and Luke strangely struggled to communicate what he saw. It was almost like he couldn't find the words. Well, yeah. I mean... Uh, Jesus. However, there, there was physical evidence. There was semen recovered from Teresa, but again, this was pre, I guess, advanced DNA times a stray red hair, and there was that twenty-two caliber bullet that he couldn't remove from her leg. As far as anyone knew, nothing was taken from the house. But we know that's not true. Right. Christmas morning, Wayne sat excitedly across from his father, George, who was in his favorite recliner. In his hands was a brightly wrapped gift, and Wayne's was his Kodak Instamatic disc camera. And when all the paper was removed, A statue of a bugling elk was revealed to his father. George loved the gift. Wayne took a picture. I hate both of them Uh, so much. He said it wasn't anything special. There's probably 40,000 of them just like it. This picture would join the many taken of his uncomfortable female co-workers. People like Chris Wells, 
He had many pictures of many girls and kept them in a box, but he did something special with Chris's pictures. He kept them in a white photo album. Written on the back of a handful of the pictures were things like, Chris Zimmerman Wells, I love you. Chris Zimmerman Wells, I'm crazy about you. Chris, I want you to live with me and my lazy boy. Uh... And he kept that picture in his wallet. He also collected her handwritten work orders and cut the sentences to form new ones. He took the love from love seat and boy from lazy boy. Smithers, you are very good at turning <laughs> me on. Basically, but this was, I love you, big boy. Ah. And he kept that in his toolbox. Hey, Kel, can you start? Yes. Can you please start calling me big boy? Gross, dude. No one at Conlin's noticed a change in Wayne after this weekend. He went about his normal life, even attending a co-worker's yearly cookie party. It was an event where everyone would show up with a dozen. Doesn't, that's a thing. You, I it, said, I've never heard about this. Mostly because I it. have no friends. Wait, what? <laughs> when do, do we do this? You do it? Okay, it's it's a Christmas. And I wasn't invited? It's a Christmas tea that my mother has. Uh-huh. And it's all women. And everybody brings a dozen cookies. And then, yeah, see? Well, Wayne was. Jamie's, at, oh, yeah. Jamie's no, coming this year for sure. She's waving it off right now. She's waving it oh, off. No. You don't want to attend. Oh, of course she's going to attend. See, Wayne was actually. It's adorable. It's like old women <laughs> okay. and like little kids, then yeah. everything in between. It's so really cute. You said it was mostly women. Wayne was actually one of the only men to attend. It's probably so what you're saying is if you're a guy. And you're at a cookie party. You're a serial, you're a serial, you're killer. A serial killer that's hunting. He brought chocolate chip cookies like he always did. What a piece of shit. I bet his chocolate chip cookies sucked. I bet they did. They're Toll House. And when I you say, don't cook that. You just eat the dough. It's true. It's <laughs> When I say no one noticed the change in Wayne, that's not entirely true. And it doesn't mean there weren't already problems. His little tantrums continued. And to Chris Wells, they got worse. During confrontations, he wouldn't really yell. But. You could sense something unsettling under the surface. And although Wayne was no doubt the best warehouse worker they had, she had wanted to fire him for a while now. She was fed up with his attitude and wasn't too happy with him practicing his art on all the boxes in the back. But it wasn't all on cardboard. He filled a four-panel window with the silhouette of a large black spider. God, he's a- Drew a portrait of the elephant man on a pillar- uh, those Conan and Rambo posters. You're supposed to be my dad. Still on the this wall. And his locker area was covered with porno mag cutouts, which I think is probably less. That uh, gets you uncommon. a talking to. Yeah. That's a trip to HR today. I don't, I don't love it. Although it was starting to feel like everyone was walking on eggshells when they were around Wayne, Chris decided not to fire him. She wasn't so much worried for herself, but what he could possibly do to Rick Mace, who was the warehouse manager. And she didn't want to find out. A while later, Wayne was dropping off some cardboard boxes uh, to that. Sheila. She was a saleswoman. She needed them for storage. The two had actually become closer friends in recent months. And after the delivery, she offered him a Budweiser. And they sat at the kitchen table talking about work. More of the same, I wish Chris liked me and I can't stand Doug stuff. But as he continued, things got a little weird. I don't believe in God. I believe in past lives. I think the reason I have such a hard time dealing with people and being in crowds is that I haven't been allowed to come back for all these past lives. I believe that in one of my first past lives, I did something bad, like kill the last extinct animal and I'm being punished. I wasn't allowed to come back. Wayne is why we don't have a unicorn? Um, The tone of his voice changed. Sheila became uncomfortable and she asked him to leave. Back at work, it was the week of Chris Wells' birthday. Everyone gathered round to cut the cake, and they actually did that with a Wayne Nance engraved knife that he donated. Uh, remember how great Wayne is at giving gifts? He's the worst gift giver, the worst photographer, the worst chocolate chip cookie okay, baker. and he's a serial murderer. Yeah. Since you didn't seem to enjoy the jewelry that I gave you, maybe you'll appreciate a piece of artwork. Wayne placed a little ceramic turtle paperweight on her desk. I may be slow and cold-blooded, but only time will tell. Wayne was becoming unglued. You could have said anything there as you set that paperweight down, and it would have been just, just as creepy. Yeah, it was August now, and the Hamilton authorities had found nothing but dead ends. They had had a, quote, strong suspect in mind, 
and even the local paper had shared this with the public. However, they were barking up the wrong tree. But Wayne didn't know that. Maybe the pressure was getting to him. Remember Bill Van Canigan? Yep. yep. It had been more than 11 years since Wayne's haunting, it's been done confession changed his life. But Wayne wouldn't really occupy his thoughts until after the Shook murders. Uh, Bill was now an attorney, like we mentioned, and he actually worked at the same law firm that Ronald McDonald did from episode one. Oh, Wayne and the Hamburglar. Oh, God. <laughs> That's right. And while on a resort trip with a friend, discussion of the case came up as they passed near the crime scene. Thoughts of the attempt to burn down the house brought back a high school memory of Bill's. One year following the homecoming parade, the Viking-obsessed Wayne actually lit one of the floats on fire. It was sort of his representation of a burial at sea. Uh, the small blaze actually made the paper. You know, I mean, out of everything else that he's done that is unspeakable and terrible and inexcusable, I have absolutely no problem with anyone that wants to set a football homecoming You're parade on fire. <laughs> not a fan of parades or high school or, or football. Yeah. Bill, being a young, successful lawyer, had purchased a nice place in the Rattlesnake neighborhood where he lived alone. Lots of folks knew this because he would often throw parties, ones that all the young trendsetters would attend. And it had been a hot summer. And he, much like Denise Tate from the last episode, had gotten used to leaving the doors and windows open to cool down his home. One night, as he was lying in bed, almost asleep, he heard something. Listening closely to the darkness, he could hear footsteps in the kitchen. He sat up in bed and continued listening, waiting a couple minutes, trying to ignore the sound of his <laughs> heartbeat. Okay. I think trying to ignore that sound? Yeah. Probably not a good idea. Moments later, though, he heard movement. Something was coming down the hallway towards his bedroom. Bill pulled a nine-iron golf club from the bag next to his bed, which is very much a rich lawyer thing typical, to do. Typical Bill. And he yelled, hey, hey, you. All he saw was the outline of a man sprinting back down the hall, running out through the kitchen, through the garage, and into the night. As a young criminal defense attorney, how do you not have a gun? I mean, he's got a nine iron, and he is deadly with that thing. He's got a very low or high yeah, handicap, depending on whatever one of those is good. On a warm Wednesday in early September, Chris and Doug Wells had plans with another couple they met through that wine tasting group. Yeah, but they weren't tasting wine tonight. They were going shooting. Sam, can you tell me anything about a lever action model 99G takedown? Uh, yeah. Sam's Weapons Authenticity Report. Um, Savage Model 99 was one of the first lever action. So, lever action is like what you see in all the, like if you're watching old western. Yeah, cowboys. Yeah, where you gotta like crank the lever down and bring it back up and it loads another round. In, in those kind of standard older lever actions, you were limited to using only round or flat point bullets because the magazine was underneath the barrel and they were lined up end to end. The bullets were within the magazine. So huh. if you use the pointy bullet, uh, which obviously has better ballistics and it's going to go farther it's faster, faster theoretically, the point would detonate the primer of the round in front of it under heavy recoil occasionally, which is a really bad thing to have happen. It just is a little bomb that goes off in your hands. That's bad news. A takedown model, uh, the front half of the gun basically pops off. You can take it down and put it in a suitcase for travel or, you know, for... If you're an assassin. An assassin, exactly. Sure. You could take it out and you have like a cool scope that you can screw on the top so of it. The more pieces you, can you put have on to put together it. in your hotel room, yeah. Yeah. the cooler <laughs> exactly. you are. Exactly. What you're looking at the window occasionally as the motorcade draws closer. Of course. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a very popular uh, uh, rifle and it's been... Uh, I don't think Savage makes it anymore, uh, mm. but it's been in, in production since 1899 or wow. was in production for um, at least 80 years. Well, you know from last week that Doug was a rather successful gunsmith with his own business, Lock, Stock, and Barrel. And as an expert, the owner of a local pawn shop called Missoula Pawn Brokers had asked him to check and see if the 1920s 99G takedown that he recently acquired fired well enough to be sold. And back home in the basement, he noticed that this weapon had excessive headspace. Sam... What is that? The excessive headspace basically means that there's too much room in the chamber, mm -hmm. the chamber in the barrel of the gun, so... You lose energy. When well, it can blow up. 
Oh, it's uh, dangerous. Yeah, so basically when you see a round of ammunition, it has to be fully and completely contained by the chamber and, and locked in place. Have you ever lit off a firecracker in your hand? Yes. Yeah. So if you hold it, really? Yeah. yeah so if you hold it like flat, it just snaps stupid. and it hurts and it burns and yeah. it pops and you can shake your hand and you're fine. If you close your hand around the firework, your skin it blows up. Yeah, because yeah. the force is all contained and generated out into your hand. Mm-hmm. Same idea. So anyway, if it has excessive headspace, there's potential for it to to have a pretty catastrophic failure. Wow. Well, Doug manufactured some cartridges in his basement that would properly fit this bigger bore. And when Chris arrived home. He grabbed her gun, which was also a Savage 99, but a newer model that he had cut down to fit his small wife. Have you done that for Kelly yet? No. You didn't size her rifle? No. I cut Kelly down to fit things. Oh, wow. The two left for their double date, which I wish was a double barrel double date, because that would be more fun to say, but they weren't shooting shotguns, they were shooting rifles. And they had a great time doing this. And Doug was happy to discover that the rounds he made actually worked And they worked pretty well. With the sun setting, they decided to call it a night, packing up and putting the remaining cartridges in the ammo box. Cooper. Yeah, Coop, Badoop. They went inside, ate barbecue chicken, drank some beers, and eventually said their goodbyes. That sounds honestly like an amazing day. (laughs) Pretty good night. Yeah, hanging with your friends, eating chicken, shooting guns. Yeah. It was about 10 minutes to midnight by the time they neared their home on Parker Court approaching from the west, turning off Reserve Street down to River Road. Oh, but you don't want to try to turn off of River Road (laughs) onto Reserve. That is very difficult. I mean, you don't want to do that. No left turns, for sure. Uh, I'll just say that my childhood home was also off of Reserve Street. I've driven the same route more times than I can count. Boy, that gets me, said Doug, noticing an orange and white Ford pickup parked just off the road on the side lawn of their property, you ever get a half park on your property? No, you got to say them. I don't think that'll happen. It bothered him so much that once both inside, he grabbed a flashlight and headed back out to have a closer look. His thoughts had went to the 14-foot boat that he had on a trailer. It could have easily been hitched up and stolen. Chris gave her dog Sundance a pat on her way through the living room. Exhausted, she headed straight to bed. Doug's boat was fine. He then made his way to the UPT, unidentified park truck. <laughs> Isn't that fun? <laughs> I was like, I was, I was about to say something. Yeah. And I was like, this is one of those things I'm going to get made fun of for not knowing You're what it an means. Idiot. So I'm just going to shut up. I'm just going to let him keep going. <sighs> Inside the UPT, he could see someone slouch down in the front seat. The man moved a little when the light shone inside, but Doug assumed that this man must have been drunk and was just sleeping it off, so he returned inside, shouting his findings to Chris, who was flipping through a copy of People magazine. Doug went downstairs to his basement shop and, like a responsible gun owner, scrubbed a bore with solvent and leaned the weapon against his reloading bench next to the six unfired rounds. But his mind kept coming back to the strange truck outside. He returned outside to record the license plate number with the intention of reporting it to the police. And I don't know about back then, but this is not the kind of neighborhood where a strange vehicle would be welcome. It's very residential. We mentioned it was more rural then, but still, this is houses where people are living. Right, right. He opened the door, stepped outside, only to discover that the truck had left. Problem solved. Back in the house now, he was filling up a glass with water to take upstairs when he remembered. Tomorrow was garbage day. Walking back down the few steps outside the front of his house, garbage bags in hand, he saw something out of the corner of his eye. Crouched down between a bush and the house was a man. Who's there? He shouted. Rising from his hiding spot, it's Wayne from Conlon's. He asked what the hell he was doing there, and stammering Wayne responded, I I saw something out here. If you have a flashlight, you better get it. Doug was obviously flustered and a little shaken by this. He didn't even have the time to put together why Wayne was in his front yard, or if this employee of his wife was the man in the truck. He turned around to grab the flashlight that he had just been using, and before he could even step over the threshold into the living room, which I'm sure was beautifully furnished, something hit him hard 
in the back of the head. Now on the floor, he rolled over, head split open, to see a wild-eyed Wayne Nance with a black billy club in his hand. Upstairs, Chris heard no words, only loud thuds, like bodies slamming against the wall and the floor. She came running down the stairs, racing over to Doug, who was bleeding badly from his scalp. Get back, I've got a gun, said Wayne, and they followed his command. Confused, Chris asked, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? What's wrong? What's happening? Wayne said, I've done something really bad. I gotta get out of town. I know Conlon's got paid today. I know you probably have money, and I want to get out of town. And we've heard this approach from Wayne before, and the last time with the Shook family, it didn't end well. No one said anything for a few minutes, and Wayne paced back and forth from room to room like a wild animal. The couple commanded their dog Sundance to lie down, and he did. Chris rested Doug's bleeding head on their ottoman, and Wayne pulled a section of white clothesline from under his shirt, forcing Chris to tie up her husband. He then tossed her a towel for his head. Wayne asked where the money was, and eventually found about $130, shoving it into his pockets. Now nervous that the two were together, and that Chris was untied, he pulled out more clothesline. They protested, but Wayne assured them, once I get out of town, I'll call somebody, and they'll come and untie you. Then you'll be free, and I'll be gone. It was now 12.30 in the morning, and Wayne had been in their house for 30 minutes. At this time, Wayne decided to separate the two, using the excuse that they would untie each other too fast if they were together. Doug, laying on his side, watched Wayne pick up his wife and carry her to their bedroom, where she, only wearing her nightshirt and underwear, had her hands tied to the bed frame, her legs tied together. He stuffed socks in her mouth and tied them in place with a pair of her pantyhose. Wayne then returned to Doug, where he gagged him as well, and untied his feet. They were headed to the basement. The door was shut behind them. Doug was tied to the wooden support post facing the stairs. He had just started sliding down to sit when he felt another blow to his head then another, then a third. Ugh. Wayne produced more clothesline and tied it around Doug's neck and the beam, then around his shoulders and under his armpits. Finally, he tied his feet, walked up the seven steps, and closed the basement door behind him. Upstairs, Chris was attempting to untie herself. She didn't get very far when Wayne walked in, checked her knots, and left without saying a word, returning to the basement. Doug had made some progress on his own knots, and when Wayne stepped in, pretended he hadn't, and Wayne had bought it. His cracks were starting to show, pacing around the room, talking to himself. You gotta be smart, you gotta be smart. You're smarter than they are, you gotta pull this off, you gotta think. Now think, what are you gonna do? How are you He's gonna do He's not it? smart though, he's really stupid. But that's something that a stupid person says, is I'm smarter than people. More blood was dripping down Doug's neck, and his head was feeling lighter. Then the two men heard a sound from upstairs. It was the bed moving. They did this dance again and again and again, up and down the stairs, noises, not checks, very few words exchanged over and over, more frenzied each time. Doug was quickly losing consciousness, and when Wayne would reappear, he was struggling to focus on him. Then he couldn't see Wayne at all. And suddenly, Doug felt it, like a punch to the chest. He looked down to see the tip of an oak handle of a Chicago cutlery knife sticking out of his chest, God. wrapped in Wayne's gloved hand. An audible oosh came from his severed diaphragm. He watched as Wayne pulled all eight inches of the blade out of his body, cleaning the blood off with his fingers. Doug slumped, hanging limp in his ropes. In the bedroom, Chris had successfully untied her left hand and feet when Wayne came in. You called the cops, didn't you? Unfortunately, she hadn't. Frenzied and frustrated, he moved around the bed looking for a more secure place to tie her. And back downstairs, Doug wasn't done living yet. Miraculously, after being hit in the head hard four times and being stabbed with an eight-inch knife in the chest, 
he got a second wind of sorts and was making serious progress on the ropes holding him back. When he turned his head to the side, he created more slack around his torso and throat. He shimmied and loosened his hands until they slipped out. Doug was free and immediately stood up. Doug is a straight badass. You're telling me, man. He walked to his workbench where the pawn shop Savage 99G takedown was leaning. And in his state and with his hunting experience, he figured with a chest wound like he had, he didn't have much time. So he loaded one bullet into his rifle, walked to the base of the staircase, kicked the wall, and waited for Wayne to come to him. Doug heard the sound of running and raised his gun, aiming at his best guess of where Wayne's torso would be, the biggest target. Wayne wildly swung the door open, and for a split second, Doug saw shock and fear in his eyes before Wayne turned his body away. Doug fired. And for a brief moment, he thought he missed. Wayne was nowhere to be seen. Then both of the Wells heard, Oh God, I'm a dead man. And believing the shot to have been directed towards her husband, not from him, Chris passes out. The bullet that was fired had torn through Wayne's side, through the living room wall, and into the darkness. Doug climbed the stairs to find Wayne on his hands and knees trying to get up. Holding the rifle by its barrel, he slammed the stock down on the back of Wayne's head, knocking him flat on the floor. But Wayne still had some fight in him. On all fours, he bear crawled down the hallway Doug close behind, bashing him the entire time. As they arrived to the bedroom, a blow came down so hard that it actually splintered the stock of the rifle. Wayne rolled onto his back and covered his face with his arms. Doug, stop. Don't do this. Please stop. I love that he got to feel that fear. Doug didn't stop, and Wayne was forced into a corner of the room next to the nightstand. At this point, Chris comes to witnessing Wayne cowering in the corner, being beaten by her husband. She joins in, punching and screaming, you son of a bitch, repeatedly. Between blows, Wayne is moving his hands lower towards his gun. With his wife joining the fight, Doug was having trouble connecting, so he pushed her out of the way onto the bed. When he looked back, Wayne's gun was pointed directly at him. Doug swung at his arm and connected, causing the shot to go into the ceiling. However, the second shot wouldn't miss. Wayne fired again, the bullet entering above Doug's knee and exiting three inches below his crotch, caught by his jeans. Now with a leg that was more or less unusable, he continued his beating. Drawing back after a hit, Doug caught a lamp that was sitting on the nightstand sending it flying, breaking the bulb. The room was now pitch black. But this didn't stop Doug, who continued swinging where he thought Wayne was. He felt something harder than Wayne's body hit against what was left of his rifle. A third gunshot lit the room. Doug, knowing the gun that Wayne had would need to be cocked every time, took advantage of this time, scrambling towards the drawer of his nightstand. Inside was a 22 caliber AMT backup. Sam, is there anything special about this gun? Sam's Weapons Authenticity Report. I would say that uh, to save you editing time, that it's a, a piece of poo. Okay, so not a great gun. It appears to be very small. It's a small, yeah, semi-automatic. Like it's a, it's a pocket gun, basically. Not very reliable. 22 caliber is not, not, very powerful not an ideal choice for this application. Doug chambered around and moved the gun to his left hand, aiming it in the direction he believed Wayne was. Then he flipped on the overhead lights. Wayne was slouched down, his eyes partially rolled up into his head. He was wheezing, his legs were quivering. He had been shot in the head, just above and behind the ear, with his own gun. They believed the blow from the rifle forced his hand upward towards himself, and in the split second the shot was fired, it shot him instead. Wow. That's... 
it's phenomenal. As lucky as Wayne has been up to this point that it's finally flipped around on him. It's mm -hmm. amazing. The Wells then threw all of the weapons onto their bed, and Chris called 911. Somebody tried to kill my husband. She hung up and began applying pressure to the wound on his chest. They called back and eventually asked, How's the other guy? Chris responded, I don't know and I don't care. Police arrived on the scene and were met by a barking Sundance at the door. They saw a tipped over couch and a smeared trail of blood that went all along the living room floor. Down the hall, they found Chris hovering over her injured husband and Wayne still shaking and twitching in the corner. Deputy Spring, one of the first to respond, was no stranger to Wayne. They had attended both grade and high school together, and it had only been about two weeks since he'd seen him last, when Wayne had delivered furniture to his house. The ambulance arrives, and Doug was carried out first. When they brought Wayne outside, the paramedics actually lost their footing when they walked into a depression, dumping him into the front yard. Are you okay? Someone joked to him as his legs were still twitching. <laughs> that's, that's funny. <laughs> Leave him a while, said someone else. They didn't. But if they did, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have a problem with no. it. No, I think we're yeah. totally fine if they come back two days later to check on him. He was loaded into the ambulance next to Doug, headed for the emergency room. What? That's wild. Yeah. I mean, I guess there probably didn't have a lot of ambulances out at that time. It really was. And he was actually in the same room in the ER. I didn't write that in my thing, but they put him in the same room <laughs> as Doug. And when Doug came to, looked up and saw Wayne's boots sticking out of the blanket, it was really fucked up. Whoa. <laughs> wow. The shot that Doug fired would have eventually killed Wayne as it passed through his midsection. It had severed the renal artery, hit the spleen, right lung, and liver, and clipped his ribs on the way in and out. The autopsy would conclude that Wayne would have had less than a minute to live. And during that last minute that he did have alive, he sustained over 60 bashes, cuts, and abrasions at the hands of the wells. It had taken 22 stitches to close the gashes on Doug's head. Wayne had used a handmade club that the warehouse guys at Conlin's had actually watched him make. I thought he worked through his brakes. <laughs> no personal work I call bullshit. Uh, the bullet that entered Doug's leg had actually brushed his sciatic nerve, leaving his foot limp at the ankle and forcing him to use a brace. The knife had missed his heart by a fraction of an inch. But it did sever his diaphragm and nicked one of his lungs, as well as the stomach lining, which caused some complications. Authorities immediately began investigating, starting with Wayne's truck, then heading to the house he shared with his father at 715 Minnesota Avenue. Uh, there's a photo that I took of this house in the show notes of last week's episode at Friday.com. They focused on Wayne's room. The maps, the knives, the photos, the rope on the bedpost, the green sheets, which Wayne's dad attempted to explain away, saying that his son had a skin condition. Detectives believe that he was using it for easy cleanup following animal sacrifices. Uh, among the items removed as evidence was that photo booth picture of Wayne with a dark-haired woman. George Nance identified her only as Robin. We know her as Debbie Deer Creek. And in 2006, thanks to forensic advancements, she would be identified as Marcella Sherry Bachman. They found the stag-handled hunting knife and elk statue that had been taken from the Shook house. George Nance's 22 caliber pistol that was borrowed by his son matched up with the slug found in Teresa's leg. George claimed Wayne was set up by the Wells, mm. saying that Chris had a crush on his son, that Doug found out about it, and invited Wayne to their house where they ambushed him. He eventually did come around, saying that Wayne did try to kill the Wells, but he, quote, didn't do all these other things, so quit trying to pin all the crimes in Missoula on him. He definitely seems like a person who should have a ceramic sculpture of a bugling elk for Christmas. No one deserves that, Sam. I think he might. Most victims of a serial killer don't survive more than two minutes once they come under the killer's control. But the Wells, who had spent more than an hour and a half with Wayne, 
managed to not only stay alive, but kill him. Something that you see often in horror films, but happens rarely in real life. Doug and Chris became regulars at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, where they have assisted its behavioral science unit who specialize in profiling murderers. No one knows for sure how many people Wayne has killed, but it's believed that he's responsible for at least the deaths of Donna Pounds, Marcy Bachman, aka Robin, and Mike and Teresa Shook. He is the only suspect in the death of Devonna Nelson and Chrissy Chrissy Crystal Cleek. Cre- <clears throat> Chrissy Crystal Cleek. I still can't do it. Still can't say her name. It's really hard. It's a tongue twister. Chrissy Crystal Cleek. Hmm. Christy Crystal Creek? Whose identity to this day remains unknown. Uh, the murder of Siobhan McGinnis, the five-year-old that was snatched from the north side in 1974, is still in dispute, but her mother believes Wayne is to blame and thanked Doug Wells for avenging her daughter's death. Quote, I don't know anything about you or how you reconciled this within your soul, but I want you to know that I think of you often and with love and compassion. And if my hand could have been with you, I would have gladly struck and killed that motherfucking monster. Yeah, he, he was the worst. And that's Wayne Nance, the, the Missoula Mauler. May he never rest. What a journey. Wow, man, that was a really fantastic report. Distressing, I need a month before yeah. the next, but it was really good. For the first time ever, Kelly, I need a Bigfoot report. Yes! I need it. Can we talk about something that doesn't... Kill people. Oh my God! Well, I mean, so, so adorable. He hasn't Thanks, except, hey, you're welcome. I know that takes a toll. I mean, I gotta say, it uh, it has. It does. It really does. Didn't expect it. Um, you can see it in my face, Jamie. Thanks for oh, dealing with me. I really appreciate it, and thank you guys so much for all the nice things that you said about the other episodes. I hope you enjoyed this one, and uh, more Byron Serial Corner episodes coming up. Wee. Yeah. You've been listening to an Audio Wool original produced by Byron McCoy. Theme music provided by Cemeteries. For more programs like this, visit audiowool.co.